Hey, welcome back. Uh, we're part two of our Galatians study. Hopefully you're uh, enjoying it. If, if you're back, at least it didn't scare you away on the first video. And uh, I think we're going to find that we have a lot of incredible truth to find as we continue to study the book of Galatians. Uh, we were going through Galatians chapter 1 last week in our intro. And uh, what we were doing was we were looking at uh, why Paul was addressing the Galatians in the first place and what he had to address with them. And we found out that Paul was kind of struggling with uh, the people not seeing him as a true apostle, uh, wondering where he got his gospel from and in his defense of that. And then also he introduces us to the issues that were taking place. Um, some of those issues specifically were those coming from Jerusalem, Judaizers, he called them, those who wanted to pull the Galatians back uh, from their liberty in Christ, back into the traditions of the Jewish nation uh, before Christ and things like that. And so he was addressing some of those issues and really addressing the, the funda fundamental truth of the gospel to them. And so we're going to continue. I think we left off last week about Galatians chapter uh, 1 verse 16. We had just a few verses left. We're going to cap off chapter 1, hopefully get through all of chapter 2 tonight. Um, don't know if that'll happen or not, but you know, we'll just kind of go as we go. Um, see how well we get, but uh, how far we get anyway. But uh, before we begin, uh, I'll ask you, wherever you are, just bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to have a word of prayer before we open God's word together. So if you'll pray with me, please. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for an opportunity to come together through the airwaves, Lord, through video. Uh, in a time when we can't meet face to face as freely as we would like to, we know that you are there with each of us in every place that we are. And so, Lord, today as we open your word together, I uh, pray that your Holy Spirit would strive with the hearts and the minds of each and every one of us as we look to your scriptures and look to the beauty that we find there of the plan of salvation, of the true gospel, and what it really means for us. And so, Lord, we thank you for being with us today. We've asked it in Jesus' name. Therefore, we know that you hear our prayer and you are willing and wanting to answer. And we thank you for the answer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take your Bible. You have your Bible? I'll give you a minute if you don't. Okay, long enough. You should have your Bible. Bible, Galatians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 16. I'm going to read to verse 24, which is the conclusion of the chapter. And then we're going to summarize that up because it's uh, uh, just a short little summary. It's not a lot of doctrinal issues there going on. We're just going to realize some of the things that are happening as we move on into the rest of the, the book of Galatians. So read along with me. I'm reading out of the King James Version again. Beginning in verse 16. There the Bible says, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was no, unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Wow, what a wonderful statement that last verse is, to have someone glorify God in you. You know, and that's really what Paul is going to be addressing as we go forward here is, are people seeing Christ in you? Is God glorified in your life and in the way you live, the way you talk, the way you treat others? And we're going to get into that in chapter 2. Um, but it, what a wonderful statement to be, able, to be able to make about anyone, you know, that God can be glorified in you. So I pray that that's your desire. It's my desire. And I pray that that's yours as well. As a Christian, it should be our desire that God is glorified in us, in all that we do. Whether we eat, whether we drink, we do all unto the glory of God. And so, and Paul is writing to the Galatians, as we look at there, <clears throat> he's, he's talking specifically that, um, he's, he's giving this this timeline, right? He said immediately, right after he had received the, the news, he comes from, from Ananias, immediately he left and he didn't confer with flesh and blood. So he didn't, he didn't go back to school, he didn't go to the apostles to be schooled on what he should be teaching. Uh, he went off into Arabia and he spent some time alone and he spent some time with the Lord. 
uh, Paul talks about being uh, he's converted, and then he you know he's he has this time with the Lord in the Word, and you can imagine that Paul had some reckoning to do with the word, uh, the message that he had grown up with, that he'd lived with, knowing the Messiah was coming, and yet now seeing that the, the coming of the Messiah was so different than what he had been told would happen, and the manner in which he came was so different than what he had been raised to uh, understand that he had to put everything in perspective and, and kind of uh, re-evaluate and re-understand uh, some of his misunderstandings, and oh, many of us have had to do the same thing. Sometimes we're raised and we think that, well, the Bible says this. You know, have you ever heard anybody say, well, the good book says, and the Bible doesn't say that at all, right? You have to understand what the Bible is saying. And Sometimes we have misunderstandings that we grew up with, and when we actually start to study and actually start to grow to know Jesus, we have to all of a sudden realize, hey, wait a minute, my preconceived notions, my preconceived ideas were wrong. And then we have to sit back and let the Bible teach us, let Jesus teach us through the Holy Ghost um, what the truth really is. And then we have to adjust our faith and adjust our lives to conform to the Word, which is important for us to know that we adjust ourselves to the Word. Uh, we don't take the Bible and conform it to our preconceived ideas. We don't take the scriptures and conform it to our desires or our way of living, our preferences. Uh, we have to let the Bible transform us. And that's a key point in any Christian's life. And, and any teacher that tells you otherwise, I would say, would be teaching you wrong because the Bible is here to transform us. And uh, we have to let the Lord do his work in us. So, so we see Paul doing that. And he, he's, he's saying, look, the Lord taught me. I went through, I studied these things. And then after three, three years, I went to Jerusalem. He went back to Damascus. Then he goes to Jerusalem for 15 days. He spends a little over two weeks. And there he doesn't meet all of the apostles, all the different disciples that were there. He meets Peter and he meets James, Jesus' brother who is now considered an apostle. He's converted, he's become a believer in Jesus Christ. And so these are the two main people he meets there. Um, and so in the fact that he meets these men and they confer with him, you might, you might think that they may be, they're examining this guy, right? Because he used to be the one who wasted the church. Remember in those last verses, it says, a lot of the people didn't know him by face, but they'd heard <laughs> that one who used to persecute us in times past, now preaches Jesus Christ. And I'm sure Peter and James and most of the other Christians in Jerusalem for sure would be wanting to know, is Saul's conversion real? You know, is he now Paul? <laughs> is he now a follower of Jesus, a believer? Is he, is he truly converted or is he just kind of trying to slip in here to get to know who we are and where we are so that he can send the troops in? And so he was a little kind of an examination by the apostles to, to see who he was. And of course, by the time it was over, they glorify God in him, and so they accepted, they understood that he had a true conversion. You know, sometimes we we want to, <clears throat> oh, how should I put that? We want to, we want others to accept us immediately. You know, oh, yep, I've changed, I'm a totally different person. Um, it doesn't necessarily always happen that way. Most of the time, we have to live our life out after conversion in a way that shows <laughs> that we have converted, that our lives are changed, and others are compelled to recognize that in us. Uh, so when you come to the Lord and your life has changed, you know, maybe you used to live a certain way and now you're living a different way because Jesus has come into your heart and you've chosen to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Uh, don't be surprised if those around you want to take a little time to watch you. Okay? They're not judging you. They're looking for fruit being born on your leaves. Right? They're wanting to see if the Christian life is being lived out in you. And that is going to confirm for them that, yes, your conversion is true. There's something that's changed in you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, right? And Paul's going to talk about that a little later on in some of his writings. He's like, I haven't attained yet. So, um, But our general direction of life, our general speech, our, our habits, our desires, all those things should start showing this transforming power of God in our lives to the people around us. And uh, and they're going to be witness to that, and then they can glorify God in you. Because if they couldn't see anything, you know, oh, he's the same guy, but he says he's converted, but he doesn't change, um, there, there would have to be some doubt in actually the power 
of the gospel. What does it mean to be converted then if you don't change? You know, the gospel is called the good news, right? That's what the gospel means. And I always tell people, look, it's supposed to be good news. Um, good news not only means that my sins are forgiven, right, through the grace of God. All of my sins of the past are forgiven through the blood of Jesus who died on the cross for me. That's good news. But the good news is more than that. The good news is also for those who uh, are living around you and with you and for you, uh, the fact that you're not the person you used to be. You know, if a man used to be, uh, you know, sinful, he was a drunk and a wife beater, and he comes to the Lord and he has this conversion experience, but he continues to be a drunk and a wife beater, is that good news for his wife? No, that's not good news. Uh, he hasn't changed, right? And so the, we would look at that and say the conversion isn't real, right? He hasn't really given his life to the Lord. He hasn't turned his life over. We don't see any fruit in his life. But the good news means that once you have that conversion and your sins are forgiven, that your life now changes and the drunkard is drunk no more. The wife beater is a wife beater no more. You know, the, all of those things start to change. That's where Paul's going to go for us in in chapter 2. And so we want to look at that because Paul has written this chapter 1 to the Galatians as a preamble kind of to the rest of the, the issues he's going to deal with to show, tell them that, look, my conversion is true, it's real, and what I taught you, it comes straight from the Lord. This is not some false teaching, some uh, some new gospel. This is the gospel that has always been taught all the way through scriptures up until now. It's just that we have it revealed to us so that we understand what it means. And and to kind of give him some validity with those who uh, he's having to have to contend with doctrinal issues on in, in Galatia. So if you take your Bibles, let's move on to chapter 2. Chapter 2, and we're going to read through verses 1 through 10 together. And uh, then we're going to go back and kind of unpack those together. So, chapter 2 of Galatians, verses 1 through 10. It says there, Then fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation, and communicated unto them that, that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run, or had run, in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, and it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. By contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. All right. What's Paul getting at? And what's the Bible telling us we need to be attentive to here as we approach the rest of the message of Galatians? First off, when we look at this, what we're going to see is that Paul is addressing a couple of things. And there's going to be more than a couple of things. But to start off with, a couple of things. One, he's talking about the gospel unity. We're going to talk about the unity of the gospel, and we're going to talk about doctrinal unity. And essentially, they're one and the same. Uh, sometimes we talk about the gospel, and we talk about the doctrine of the Word of God. The doctrine of the Word of God, the doctrine of the Gospel, is just the teaching of the Gospel. That which is true about the Gospel as we look at the Scriptures. And so he's, he's going to approach these issues as we talk here, and, and there's a reason for it, and we'll get to that as we go through the chapter. So the first reason he tells us why he's going. And he gives us this reason for going. He was, he was impressed by God to go, he says, by revelation, right? He says, I wasn't, somebody didn't come to me and say, hey, you need to go and prove yourself. He's just impressed by God to go. He needs to go and talk to the other leaders of the Christian movement now. He wants to talk to the leaders of the church. And he wants to express what, what he has been teaching um, to the other apostles. He wants to go and, and sit down and 
have a discussion about the gospel and see if he's on track. Now, he knows he's on track, but he wants them to understand that too. He says that to see that I have not run in vain, it's not it's saying that he felt he was wrong in something, um, but that the work that he had done in Galatia, the, the teachings that he had taught them were not done in vain. You know, he's, so he's going there for confirmation of the gospel. And so that what we're seeing is this coming together of the unity of the message of the gospel. And that's really what this is talking about. So he has this coming together so that all of that wouldn't be undone by these Judaizers that are in Galatia saying, oh, no, no, you have to go backwards. You have to go back into the circumcision. We have to go back into all the, the laws of Moses and the traditions of the elders and all those kind of things because that's where we came from. All right, And so they wanted them to go back, and we talked a little bit about that last week. And so he wants to make sure. And so we, we look at these issues and it says, look, these were the issues that was they were facing in Galatia. Circumcision and going back into the law of Moses. Now, there's no context here that's telling us he's talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about circumcision and the law of Moses. And so we have to understand those two separate laws in the Bible to be a little clear in our minds. Uh, the law of God... We talk about the law uh, in the Hebrews' mind. You'd have the idea of the law. The first significant law is the law of God, the Ten Commandment law, the divine law, that moral law that, can, that, that applies to all of us as we live our lives and how we should live our lives toward God and toward our fellow man. Then you have the uh, the second law in the in Hebrews' mind, If they, when they would say law, we, they're thinking of the first five books of the Bible, which we call, you know, it, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Viticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, the Jewish people call it the Torah. Uh, you have that those five books of the Bible. When they talk about the law of Moses, they're talking about those first five books, right? And all of the different uh, ceremonial aspects of worship and all of those types of things that are involved in that. And part of that law of Moses included circumcision. And so we have to make sure we're separating those two. Now, why do we separate them? Um, one of the main reasons is because God distinguishes the two as being different. Um, he, they're distinguished from each other. The Ten Commandments were written by God with his finger in stone, and those two tables of stone uh, were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. And they are the basis of the covenant. And so you can't have a covenant without the Ten Commandments. You can't have an old covenant or a new covenant without the commandments of God. I mean, there is that's the basis of the covenant, period. Um, all of those obviously are pointing to Christ because Christ was a fulfillment of the law, right? He, not that he did away with it, but that he lived it to the full. He showed us what living by the Ten Commandments looks like in a, in a human's life. Uh, the law of Moses, so the ceremonial laws, all of those other things were written down by Moses, and he put them in a scroll or scrolls, and they were placed beside the ark. They weren't inside the ark. They were beside the ark. They were not as honored as the the Ten Commandments. They were beside the ark. And they were put there as a testimony against you, according to the Bible, uh, both in uh, the Old Testament and in Colossians, that the testimony against us. Because had we not sinned, broken the Ten Commandments, we would not need the ceremonial law, which depicts the coming of the Savior, the death of the Lamb, the blood shed for your sins. And therefore, that is a witness or a testimony against me because of my sin. It doesn't mean that it's bad for me because, praise God, Jesus came. It was a promise of that. But the fact that he had to come to die for me was a witness against us. And so the two are distinctly different. They're tied together because the law of God, by us breaking it, the Ten Commandments, precipitated the necessity of the ceremonial law, which was a foreshadowing of the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so they're linked, but they're different. Okay? You kind of get that? All right. Just to make sure. And uh, so, so Paul's talking about here, he's not speaking so specifically about the Ten Commandments. Yeah, so he's talking about this law of, of Moses, the ceremonials, and all of the different things that were involved in being Jewish. Uh, we see that coming to a head, this whole issue, uh, if we turn in our Bibles and look at Acts chapter 15. Uh, you want to take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 15, where we see this Jerusalem Council where they're talking about these very same issues. They're not talking about the Ten Commandments. They're talking about the ceremonial laws, the laws of Moses, the circumcision. And if we look in chapter 15 of the book of Acts, uh, in verse 1, verse 1 says, A certain men came down from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, 
Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Wow. So, think of the Gentiles that Paul's been teaching in Galatia. And having someone from Jerusalem, which is where the church began, right? The church came out of Jerusalem. Someone from Ju Jerusalem comes and says, look, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. And you've been told that, hey, faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus died for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And you are saved by grace through faith. And then someone says, no, no, no. And literally here it means in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, when they say, if you're not circumcised after the man of Moses, when it says you cannot be saved, it means you don't have the power to be saved. Wow. All of a sudden you're sitting there thinking, well, my salvation is in jeopardy because I'm not circumcised. And, and all of a sudden you start thinking in your mind, oh, wait a minute, maybe what Jesus has done wasn't enough. I have to do something in order to affect my salvation, which is the danger that's going on here. And we're going to see that as it comes through, because it's basically what this is, this doctrine that says you have to be circumcised or you don't, you can't, don't have the power to be saved, even though you have faith in Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's an affront to faith in Christ being all we need. It's an affront to righteousness by faith. It's an affront to the gospel. And so Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is confronting this error that's being taught. And of course, in verse 5, we see the very same thing still in Acts chapter 15. It says, But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to be circumcised them, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Okay, important. Not, it's not saying that they, you know, they were contending with the idea that you, you, know, you shouldn't. Paul's not saying you shouldn't keep the Ten Commandments. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. This is all about the law of Moses. This, this whole conflict here is talking about going back into Judaism. And so we want to make sure that we understand that. And so, so Paul, going to Jerusalem now, um, he brings along some living testimony. And I think this is kind of interesting how Paul does this. He decides, since he's confronting this in Galatia, um, the fact that these people are teaching you have to be circumcised in order to become uh, saved. You, can't, you don't have the power to be saved unless you, you're circumcised. He brings along a friend, and he brings along a friend named Titus. Titus is a convert, but he's a Greek, and he's uncircumcised. But he's a believer in Jesus Christ. And so Paul brings Titus, this uncircumcised Greek Christian, to the apostles in Jerusalem. And he, I'm sure he presents him and said, look, here's Titus. Titus loves the Lord Jesus Christ. He believes that Jesus was the Messiah. He believes he died on the cross. He has salvation. You're telling me because this man isn't circumcised that he doesn't have the covering blood of Jesus. And I'm sure it was quite a conversation. I'm sure Titus was more than happy to be there, I assume, right? I mean, he wants to testify of his faith for the Lord. And uh, But Paul brings Titus there to, to accompany him to... to to bind the apostles together in a way that is really talking about church unity. Okay, This idea of church unity, um, bringing all of us together, not just some people from this generation or this nationality, but he's saying, look, Christ died for all. Right? And so he brings Titus along. Um, and so he brings Titus, and he, he approaches the, the leadership in Jerusalem. But you'll notice that he doesn't go about um, preaching from the street corners, that the, you know, these people are wrong, this and this. The Bible says there in, in Galatians chapter 2, notice after he goes up in verse 2, he goes up by revelation, communicates unto them of the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them that were of reputation. And so, privately to the leaders, he goes in and he doesn't make a big splash, right? He doesn't cause all sorts of revolution all over the church. He goes into the leadership and he says, look, this is what I've been teaching. This is what the Bible expresses. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he explains the situation to them. And they sit down and they have a discussion, right? And respect. So, he has respect for the leadership, of the church. He has respect for the, the apostles that have been walking with Jesus, and he has respect for them. He's not going about trying to undermine their, um, their reputation, their, their, their influence with the people. He's not trying to do that. He's, he's coming in there, and he's being very respectful. Not only that, but he's also respecting the unity of the church in doing that. Um, 
we find it very um, plainly depicted in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, where we find people who are teaching contrary to the Word of God that have come into the church. That's why Paul says they came in privately. They came in secretly, sneakily. They snuck in, and they're teaching something that's contrary to what the truth is. Um, remember, he calls it a false gospel. Uh, matter of fact, we le read last week that he, he calls them accursed, um, which is very strong language. Uh, so there's a to bring in the unity of the church and the unity of doctrine. As we look in the verses 3 and 5, um, talking about Titus again, you know, he's talking about these false brethren. There's some discussion there, right? And uh, verse 4 says, And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might bring us back into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, and the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So they must have sat down and had some discussion, and there were these men who were going to contend with Paul, saying, no, 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 you must be circumcised. But he wouldn't give them, he would give them no time. He said, look, you're not teaching properly. This isn't, we're not going to give place to you. We're not going to give you that platform to, to spread this false teaching. We're going to explain to you, this is what the truth is. And we see that the leadership of the church coalesces around the truth of the gospel. And uh, what Paul is teaching is, is purely the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we see that the, 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 the leadership in Jerusalem comes together. Obviously, by the time we get to verse 10, it says only that they would, or I'm sorry, verse 9, uh, James and Cephas, which is Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, and they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen. And so they gave them the right hand of fellowship. They're saying, you are teaching the truth of God's word. We are one, right? The right hand of fellowship. We're unified in this teaching. And so, and by the way, when you see the words heathen and Gentile and the nations, right? It just means the nations. It just means those who were not of the Jewish nation, right? They weren't of Jewish lineage. Uh, they weren't part of the tribe of Israel or the tribes of Israel. And so when you we see heathen, it's not necessarily a bad name. We've kind of used the term in a derogatory way. You know, we see somebody sinning horribly and very visibly and we call them heathen, right? Um, that's not really the usage in the Bible. Uh, heathen, Gentile, just means of the nations, you know, those outside of, of the nation of Israel, or later on we might think outside of the Christianity. Uh, it's not necessarily derogatory, it just separates them out from those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of the usage here. And so they have this discussion and they go on. And, and the lesson we can learn from this, you know, that we don't want to, uh, oh, how do I want to put it? Um, they don't want to take away from the gospel, right? The, the, the concept of putting something else in the process of salvation, something that you do. And we mentioned this last week, where it's not something that you do, it's something that's been done for you. Uh, think of Romans chapter 2. Maybe go there with me. Romans chapter 2, um, verse 28 and 29. Uh, if you're flipping there, I, I can hear the pages. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Listen to what, this is what Paul's writing to the Romans here. It says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So he's talking about circumcision, right? Both in Galatians and in here in Romans. And he's saying circumcision, is, it's not this outward thing, right? Because circumcision, when you go back into the Old Testament, you start reading where circumcision came into being with, uh, with the co covenant with uh, Abraham. Um, the fact that you know circumcision was this rite of passage, if you will, for the children. It was a symbol of them of being as children of God. But what good is it if a man is circumcised in the flesh and he lives like the devil, Right? I mean, what use is the, what good is your circumcision then? And that's basically what Paul is saying. Circumcision means nothing if it's in the flesh, and it means nothing in the heart. It's the circumcision of the heart that matters. So you can be you can call yourself a Jew because you're circumcised in the flesh, but it doesn't mean you're a believer. You can call yourself a Christian, uh, but if 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 it's just an outward thing and it's nothing on the inside, it's not a change in your life, a change in your desires, a change in your heart. Um, all that outward stuff means nothing. 
um, because you're trying to put it in front of. And so the lesson I think we can learn from this is when we're looking at this, we can see that, you know, these false brethren that were coming in, Paul's words, not mine, these false teachers that were coming in, were trying to substitute uh, an empty sign. We might call it an empty sign, the circumcision, just something that you do, uh, for the true transforming faith of the gospel. Uh, the power of the gospel grace, right? They're trying to say, well, you have to have this or else you can't be saved. Well, wait a minute. Um, Jesus died for everyone where you are today. And putting something in front of that diminishes the power of the gospel. So I think the lesson we can learn from this is that anything that teaches you to, uh, to or leads you to trust in any object or anything or any person or a picture or to trust in any work or effort on your own um, is a perversion of the truth. It's a perversion of the gospel. And we have to count it as false. And so if in any way someone teaches that salvation comes by anything other than faith in Jesus Christ alone, um, then we have to set that aside because that's not the truth. Because you can't do anything in your power to affect your salvation. Uh, the only part you play is accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, willingly giving yourself to the Lord and believing on Jesus Christ. That's your part. God has done everything else. But now Paul is not going to leave us there because um, we're talking about salvation. And we noted last week that salvation, I think we noted it last week. If we didn't, I'm going to note it now. Um, salvation is, is multifaceted, right? Salvation is not only justification, but salvation is also sanctification. Therefore, good news, not only for the past sins being forgiven, but transforming of my life into the future. And so salvation has to come from both of those angles. And so we're going to look at that because Paul's going to address that. And so let's go back to Galatians chapter 2. And uh, we go back to Galatians chapter 2. And as we look in there, we're going to find in verses 11 through 13 that Paul's going to bring us to the situation where we need to be. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the rest of this. So now in Galatians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 11, uh, 11, 12, and 13. We're going to take a little short piece here because this is a fairly short chapter and so I'm hoping I have enough time to get done with it. I'm looking at my clock. I don't know if we're going to get done. All right. Verse 11. Okay. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulations. What's dissimulation? Well, basically, literally, it means playing the hypocrite. Okay? Um, Peter played the hypocrite, and all sorts of other people played the hypocrite with him. And so we, we were looking at this, and he said, what, you know, here were Jews eating with Gentile believers. Okay, Jewish Christians, we'll call them Jewish Christians. They're all Christians, we're all Christians. But they were, there was this, this, this separation yet in the minds of the Jewish believers, that you have Jewish Christians, you have Gentile Christians. And Peter was there, and he was eating with all the Gentiles, having a good time, because, you know, Peter, he was born and raised like Paul, uh, he's been born and raised um, knowing, I shouldn't say knowing, believing that Jews were a separate people, a distinct people, a special people, and all the other people, would they would defile you. They'd make you unclean. And so you weren't to eat with them, or you weren't to do business with them. You, know, you can't even touch them in some situations. They would defile you. And so they had this preconceived prejudice against anyone who was not a Jew. And But God had instructed Peter uh, that this was incredibly wrong. Uh, we find that in Acts chapter 10, where Peter goes up to the top of the building, and he's hungry, and he lays down for a nap, and he has this vision. Um, Acts chapter 10 describes the vision. Peter in vision sees this sheet coming down from heaven three times, filled with all sorts of unclean animals, and hears a voice from heaven saying, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, Lord, Lord I've never put anything unclean into my mouth. And this happens three times, and then it goes up, and Peter wakes up, and the Bible says, Peter wondered in his heart, what in the world is that supposed to mean? And immediately there's somebody knocking at his door. It just so happens there are three Gentiles knocking at his door. 
they were sent to him by another Gentile who was desiring to have Peter come and preach the gospel to him. Peter goes with them. He goes and he preaches the gospel, but he tells them as he comes to the door, do you want to read it for yourself? Let's go to Acts chapter 10. I know I can explain it to you, but maybe it would be better if we read it. Okay, Acts chapter 10. Peter comes to the door. Um, we're going to start pick it up in verse 25. This is where Peter's coming into, into the door of Cornelius' home, the, the man who sent the three servants, the three Gentiles, to go and get Peter. Uh, chapter 10 of Acts, verse 25. This is what the Bible says. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. Went in and found many that were come together. So Peter, now he's in a household full of... Of Gentiles. For a Jew, <laughs> I shouldn't even be here, right? But notice what Peter tells us. Verse 28. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come in unto one of another nation. Now i got to stop for a moment. Unlawful. If you look in the Ten Commandments, Will you find a law that says a Jew should not keep company with a Gentile? No. So what law is he talking about? He's talking about the law of Moses. He's talking about something totally different. He says it's unlawful. Who made up that law? Did God say oh, you're, you shouldn't go eat with the Gentiles? God never said they shouldn't eat with the nations around them. He, should, he said in the Old Testament you shouldn't worship like the nations around you. You shouldn't uh, you know, bring in their worship and bring in their sinful ways into your camp you should be a witness to them and converting them but he never said you shouldn't associate with them you shouldn't sit with them you can't touch them oh god never said that that's that's jewish law that came in later traditions of the elders things like that this is what peter's dressing now listen to what he says this is really good on peter's part he was listening to the holy spirit he's remembering what he had envisioned now he says but god hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. There's the message of the vision. Peter didn't understand it at first, but then all of a sudden he had three Gentiles, people he would consider unclean, just like the food he saw coming down was unclean, the animals. And he realized, God isn't telling me to eat unclean food. <laughs> He's telling me that there's no men that are unclean that God has cons had given Jesus Christ for the salvation of all people. And I'm not to be prejudiced against someone from another nation, from another race, or whatever it may be, if they're, if they, when they accept Jesus Christ. There's no prejudicial treatment with God. God's not a respecter of persons in that way. He, he looks at us as all fallen sinners and children of his that he wants to save and bring home. And, and Peter needed to realize that. The Jewish Christians needed to realize that. So they had to be they had to be disaffected of all of those old prejudices that were in the world, right, in their mindset. And God's trying to show them that and he's breaking those prejudices down and one of it was this dream. Now Peter gets in trouble for going and sharing the gospel with these Gentiles, but he knows that this was God's moving because the Holy Spirit falls upon these Gentiles and they begin speaking in tongues, so it's a sign that yes, God has accepted them, they have the gift of the Holy Spirit. He goes back and the rest of the apostles and the other disciples and the other people in Jerusalem say, Peter, hey, what are you doing? You went into these Gentiles. You can't do this. And so he repeats the story to them, uh, Acts chapter 11. And uh, he tells them, this is exactly what happened. I saw this vision. This is what happened. And God did this wonderful thing. And so we get to Acts chapter 11. And we see it happening all over again. And after the apostles hear Peter's testimony, chapter 11, verse uh, 17 and 18, it says, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And verse 18 says, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And so God was teaching them through this. And so we have this change of understanding for Peter way back here in Acts chapter 10. But now all of a sudden we get to, in Galatians, 
Peter, having known better, should have having known better, um, he was living out for a while this principle that God had given him, the idea that uh, he should be able to uh, be there and, and fellowship with the Gentile Christians. And I, I'm calling them Gentile Christians, so we keep this in focus because I'd like to just call them other believers, but then we wouldn't be able to discern what we're supposed to learn here. But in Galatians chapter 2, where Paul is addressing Peter, um, he has to withstand him to his face because Peter dissimulated. He played the hypocrite. All of a sudden, men from Jerusalem came, the Jewish Christians, and they were much more uh, staunchly yet holding on to these old uh, prejudices, these old laws that God had already shown Peter were, that's not even what I want you to live by. And Peter stops eating with the Gentiles. He had been fellowshipping with them. Uh, you know, the Bible tells us in Acts that they, they ate daily together. Um, but all of a sudden now Peter, uh, he doesn't want to eat with them. And so he dissimulates. He goes off and he separates himself from the Jews. And Paul sees this and he says, oh, wait, <laughs> what are you doing? I mean, you're, you're, you're starting to, down a really bad road. And so, and what was, you know, that was... You know, that was what was happening. And you have to say, well, why did Peter do that? I mean, here he's, he knows the truth. You know, Peter, there's a few points in Peter's life where the pressures of the people around him, uh, maybe fear of other people. And as a matter of fact, that's what the Bible actually says. It was a fear of the people. Um, when you look in verse 12, chapter 2 of Galatians, verse 12, it says, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing them. Peter was fearing the men. He feared man. In this, in this moment, Peter feared man more than he feared God. Um, I can give you another example of a point in time in Peter's life when he feared men more than feared God, and that's when he denied Jesus three times. And so Peter's maybe slipping back a little bit into, you know, oh, I don't, I, I, you know, I'm worried about what they're going to think of me, and 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 so the fear of man gets in the way of his fear of God, his love for the Lord. And and Paul confronts him on this, and he confronts him openly. And you might think, well, why didn't he do it privately? You know, last time Paul addressed some doctrinal issue, he did it privately. Just a few verses before, remember, he went in Jerusalem and he spoke privately with those of reputation. So why is Paul doing this so publicly? He confronted him to his face, right, and right there. Well, you have to understand that what Peter was doing and causing others to do, right? So we, we have this cause, he was fearful. Um, the effect of that was that Peter and many of the others were reverting back to their old discriminatory ways. They were going back into something that they shouldn't have been in the first place, this prejudicial view of people. Uh, the danger in that is that the idea that there's two different Christianities. There's Jewish Christianity and there's Gentile Christianity. And that somehow they're different, right? Somehow being a Jew and converted to Christ is different than being a Gentile and being converted to Christ. And we have to live separately and, and act differently. But here in Galatians, Paul is essentially teaching us, and I keep saying Paul teaching us, but it's God teaching us. This is not so. There is no difference in a Jew becoming a Christian or a Gentile becoming a Christian. I don't care if you're a Gentile from Russia or from Australia or from North Dakota or Minnesota or Sweden. It doesn't matter where you're from. If you're a Gentile and you become a Christian or if you're a Jew and you become a Christian, you've become one. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And there isn't a separate set of codes for the Jewish Christians versus the Gentile Christians. And this is a lesson we're learning here because this is the danger that people fall into. Oh, you come from this background, so you live this way as a Christian, but you've been a Jew, and so you need to keep your Jewishness and continue in this. But that doesn't... No, no. The gospel of Christ brings us all together. And so you can see Paul's addressing some unity in the gospel. He's bringing the church together because God is bringing the church together as one, not separate entities scattered all about. No, the, the gospel brings us together as one. We all have to come to Jesus. We all have to come to the cross. We all need the blood of Jesus. And Jesus' death on the cross sets us all free to have liberty in Christ. And so there is no 
two different ones. It's all in Christ. And we have to remember that today because there's a lot of times people want to separate that off. You know, they want to say, oh, we have to continue some, we have got to be kind of like the Judaism of old and go back into the law of Moses and back into the ceremonies and things like that. God says, no, we don't have to do that. There's liberty in Christ. Now, some of those things in the past were there for our learning. They were all there for our learning. Uh, some of the ceremonial things have much deep spiritual meaning that we should learn from to guide our lives, to guide our devotion to the Lord, but they're not something that brings you salvation. Uh, they were all pointing to the one who would bring you salvation, who is Jesus Christ. And this is what the issue that Paul's dealing with here. And uh, I can see that we are never going to get done with this chapter tonight. And so um, I'm going to leave us there. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 14 as we come back, but I want to leave you with this tonight. Um, in Christ, we are all one. Okay, There's a unity in Christ. Uh, but Paul is bringing the church together as we see the Bible coming together and the, the doctrine is being taught. And I'm using the term doctrine specifically because when I talk about unity of the gospel, it is unity of doctrine. Okay, Because doctrine is just a teaching about God. It's a teaching about the salvation. The gospel is a doctrine. There is doctrine within the gospel. And there is a unity in that. And God wants us to come together being unified with the word of God. He has given us the truth in the word from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We're right here in the middle in Galatians and we're, that we're, we're uncovering beautiful aspects of, of justification and sanctification as we go on in the next chapters. But as we see what God is doing for us, and we see what he has done for us. We are unified in Christ. And so we come together in him. He's the head, we are the body. Christ is not the head of multiple bodies. He's the head of one body. We are different parts and pieces. You know, we're different members, but we're all one body. And so there's, there's a unification that's happening in this early church of bringing together from all walks of life, from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, to borrow a scripture from Revelation. Um, in that we have a unity of the faith of Jesus Christ. And so as we go on, we're going to find out there's some very important, very important key ideas that we need to understand as Paul addresses this issue. He's not only going to be talking about this law that was passed away, right? He's going to talk about this law that has been done away with that he's dead to. Um, but he's going to be talking about a change in life. And so sometimes when we go through Galatians, it's easy to kind of get twisted up because we think Galatians is, all about, is only about justification. But Galatians is not just about justification, your salvation through Jesus Christ, having your sins forgiven, but it's also about your sanctification. Galatians is really a, it's really a talking about the total package of the gospel. Justification, sanctification, which leads us that wonderful day when Jesus is going to come and take us home to be with him. And so, God bless you tonight. I hope uh, we'll see you again next week. We'll pick up in uh, chapter four, 2, verse 14 of Galatians. And uh, as we leave, I'd like to leave you with a short prayer and a blessing. So please bow your head with me. Father in heaven, thank you that, Lord, that you've given us such wonderful truth in your word that uh, through you, in some miraculous way, through our faith and grace that you've given us, we all, no matter what nation, language, kindred, or tongue we are, can all become one in you. And so, Lord, I pray tonight that our, if we have any prejudices in our hearts, if we have any preconceived ideas of, of uh, discriminatory things in our minds, Lord, that we would just let them wash away in the blood of Jesus tonight, and that we would become one. And Lord, we pray as we continue to study your word that you would bless us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, watch over us until we can come together again to open your word once more. And in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope it's been a blessing for you tonight, and we'll, uh, we'll see you again next week. I'll post another uh, study, hopefully on Tuesday or Wednesday next week. And uh, until then, may God be with you, and remember this, that Jesus is coming again. Good night.